Hi everyone and a very good evening and welcome to this uh, YouTube live session. So I'm Dr. Preeti and today for the upcoming exams I've just got a mixed bag of questions from pathology which is uh, going to cover general path, a little bit of hemat, systemic path. So a good mix of questions just how you would get it in your exam. So uh, I guess we can begin and all the students who are joining us in this series of the five day lectures today if you're joining us then the previous three days have been extremely important tables that we've discussed and uh, coming back to the feedback that I've got from the students has been uh, that you've benefited a lot from those table revision. So yes, after this quiz and uh, coming month, that is in the month of November, the remaining tables also, especially the breast pathology tables or the tumor suppressor genes, I would be taking up those as well so that you can revise all those tables before your exam. Okay, so uh, what do we have today? Today and tomorrow I'll give you a brief and then we'll begin. Today we have a quiz. It's going to be a slightly lengthy one because I've got a couple of questions for all of you. We'll, I'll give you a question. I'll give you 15 to 20 seconds to answer. Then we'll discuss the question. Second, tomorrow we have a session again at 6 o'clock. This is particularly for the students who are appearing for the upcoming November INI CET because I'm going to discuss with you the must know. I'm going to give you a list of the must know topics that you have to prepare in the last 20 days. So I'll give you a list of that. I'll tell you how a very short session, how you have to proceed in these last 20 days when it comes to PATH. And I'll give you a PDF also of all the topics that you need to revise in this last moment. Okay. So uh, without any further delay, let's begin. Can I get a quick thumbs up if the audio video is clear, guys, and uh, there's no issue with the technical part? If not, then I guess let's begin right away. Uh, all of those you know, there's a live chat box. You can uh, comment in that live chat box. You can send me a thumbs up if the audio video is fine. And then we begin. So that is exactly where all of you have to give up your answers also today, right? So uh, let's, yes, let us begin. Okay, great. So all's good. We can start. Perfect. Um, yes, there's uh, there's no poll or anything because you know that YouTube doesn't have a poll just like the Unacademy platform does. Uh, so this uh, session you'll have to, uh, you know, answer on the live chat box, right? Let's begin. So this is question number one. And the level of the questions is a mix, okay? It's a easy, medium, tough level. Mixture, good mixed bag. Which of the following, following is not used to study, study epigenetics? Bisulfite sequencing, bisulfite sequencing, chip, HPLC or fish? Bisulfite sequencing, chip, HPLC or fish? Uh, you need to tell me um, which is not used for the study. So quickly tell me for epigenetics, which of these will you not use? And then I'll tell you a list of the, uh, you know, the, the methodologies that you can use for epigenetics. Okay, so I've got a, uh, okay, I've got a confusion between C and D, but majority of you are putting up, okay, it's almost same, C and D almost coming up same. So the answer over here is, HPLC. So first and foremost, you need to know quickly in a line what is epigenetics and then you have to know that how are you going to uh, detect or how are you, what is the laboratory technique with which you can detect epigenetics. Okay, so HPLC is not a technique for uh, epigenetics. Epigenetics means above genetics. When I say above genetics, I mean it is a qualitative, qualitative phenomena. It's a qualitative phenomena or you can call it a functional phenomena, right? So it is nothing to do with quantity. It is nothing to do with addition or deletion of the genes. It is a qualitative phenomena or a functional phenomena. Means you can switch on a gene, you can switch off the gene. You can switch on and off the function of the gene, right? So please remember... One way by which you can do that is DNA methylation. One of the most common ways, if you want to uh, say, for example, switch off a gene, you can do DNA methylation, a very common technique. So how do you get to know in the lab that has a gene undergone DNA methylation or has a gene undergone epigenetics? How, what are the techniques? A long list coming your way. So don't get too, uh, you know, I would say intimidated by the list. It's a very simple list now, guys. See, all that you'll have to do is A, B, C, D, E, F. So remember, for the analysis, 
for the analysis of epigenetics so what have we done for the analysis for the analysis of epigenetics what all can we use we can use bisulfite sequencing we can use chip technique i hope all of you know what is chip chip is chromatin immunoprecipitation chromatin immuno chromatin immunoprecipitation d for a technique known as dam id dam id if you're good with mnemonics uh, you know if you're good with full forms then you should know what is dam id it is dna adenine methyl transferase identification so id is for identification knowing the id knowing the identification by what technique dam id dam is dna adenine methyl transferase basically it will help you know dna methylation status hai na okay e for epigenetics and f for fish so what are the techniques simple a and e for analysis of epigenetics i do bisulfite sequencing chip i do dam it and we do fish so coming back to your question your question was which of the following is not bisulfite is chip is fish is as well hplc was not there in the list and you won't mark that question number 1 clear with everyone let's proceed forward let's go on to question number 2 so um many of you gave me a right answer which is amazing let's go to question number 2 guys let's start reading there's a 30 year old man so i'll highlight the points who presents with multiple soft tissue swellings which are attached to the nerve multiple pigmented lesions are seen over the abdomen ophthalmoscopic examination shows you hamartomatous lesions i think everyone's thought of the disease as such which of the following mechanisms is related to the mutation that this patient has got yes so uh, first and foremost i guess everyone has um, everyone has already uh, seen the disease i hope you got the disease right you've got a patient with soft tissue swellings you've got a patient uh, that swelling is something to do with nerves you've got pigments you've got hamartomatous lesions in the eye so yes no answers up till now guys not even a single answer up till now why is it that tough a question that tough a question one answer i've got from uh, okay so i've got three answers a b and c everyone agrees i give you last 5 seconds give me any answer that you think of if you would have gone in for a guess work in this what would you have thought of okay so fine we'll talk about this see uh, first and foremost so uh, this was i think a, a googly question not many got it uh, right so wait uh, what disease did you think of what is the disease that all of you thought of when i said nerve and i said pigmented lesions and i said hamartomatous lesions what did you actually think of i hope everyone thought of neurofibromatosis type 1 nf1 so nerve related soft tissue swelling neurofibromas pigmented lesions over the abdomen cafe au lait spots hamartomatous lesion in the eyes leash nodules so please remember answer is a and how did we come to a look at this see a uh, neurofibromatosis type 1 this was the disorder that they spoke about over here where the patient had multiple swellings attached to the nerve that is neurofibromas patient had pigmented lesions over the abdomen that is cafe au lait spots patient had hamartomatous lesions in the eye that is leash nodule so before you understand you know this is obviously because of a defect in the nf1 gene before you know what is nf1 doing you will have to learn why did i say persistent activation of ras because you'll have to know the ras pathway not too much in detail i just want to tell you the basic so if i say do you all remember we just studied uh, day before yesterday a table about ras what were the three alphabets of ras guys what were the three alphabets of ras i hope you remember the mnemonic k ras h ras and n ras hai na k ras h ras and n ras so that is the ras oncogene proto oncogene that we are talking about over here look at this so whenever growth has to happen whenever cell growth has to happen what happens there's a growth factor that growth factor will come and bind over here to the growth factor receptor inactive ras will change into active ras inactive ras will change into active ras how by the change of gdp to gtp so what happened 
inactive ras has changed into active ras you have to learn the story from here only then you'll understand the relation with nf1 okay inactive ras changes to active ras and for that gdp converts to gtp so now tell me for the activity of ras to remain intact what is important gdp remains intact or gtp remains intact if you want to keep ras forever functioning what will you keep gdp intact or gtp intact obviously you will keep gtp intact so can i say that if i go and break this gtp the activity of ras will also be gone if i break the gtp ras will go back into its inactive state do you agree yes so exactly in your body normally every time growth is not happening na when the work of ras is over you tell ras that okay come back to your inactive form when you want to make it active you give it gtp when you don't want it to be active you bring it back you break the gtp so remember every ras molecule every ras molecule has its own gtpas activity it says it's very sensible it says when my work will be over when my work will be over i'm going to uh, come back into my silent state so every ras knows breaks the break the gtp and come back to inactive form you know what this gtpas is activated by it is activated by gaps gtpas activating proteins remember gtpas activating protein so now look at the story i'm taking you back to that i know this is a tricky one but this is important i n i c e t questions can't be that easy look at this taking you back over here can i say that if i have gap gtpas activating protein that will activate the gtpas that will activate the gtpas and that will break this gtp agreed gtpas activating protein will activate the gtpas will break the gtp and ras will come back to its inactive form does everyone agree with me up till now neurofibromin 1 nf1 is this gap nf1 if someone asks you what function does it have in your body it's actually a gap it activates gtpas breaks the gtp brings the ras back however if i say if i say that someone has a loss of function of gap gap is not act, is not functioning like nf1 nf1 is not functioning tell me now give me a yes or no everyone nf1 is not functioning gap is not functioning will gtpas be activated will gtpas be activated and will gtp be broken yes or no if gap does not function will gtpas be activated and will gtp be broken it will not it will not be broken so will ras come back into its inactive form will ras come back into its inactive form yes or no it will not can i say that if there is a loss of function this means ras is forever going to be active persistent activation of ras is going to occur and exactly what happens in nf1 everyone agrees nf1 everyone agrees to this nf1 is a gap gap means gtp is activating protein if there is no nf1 a loss of function or gap there is a loss of function gtp is will not be broken ras will never become inactive ras is forever active and pro forever proliferation is happening that is why the patient is going to show you neurofibromas and all those lesions that you saw so taking you back to the question do you agree the answer was persistent activation of ras got it everyone tough question i know but i hope you will start thinking in terms like this because we are dealing with obviously a central institute exam paper so we need to go a little edge higher okay let's move on to the next question i think this is everyone's favorite by now because i've answered this so many times on telegram you've got a flow cytometry dot plot and i want you to give me the disease that they are trying to show you by this so you need to analyze this flow cytometry dot plot guys and we need to take it up with the disease so your options are lad1 lad2 bruton zegama globulinemia and hyper igm syndrome if you know how to read a basic flow cytometry dot plot you will get it right even if you have attended my telegram discussions you will definitely get it right okay so here the answers that i've got are predominantly d up till now hyper igm is what everyone is thinking yes so you are right on that the answer to this is hyper igm but how did we come to that conclusion so here you got two dot plot charts one and two 
So let us let us first understand how do you interpret a flow cytometry dot plot. You you know like over here, can you see the examiner has divided it into four quadrants. So like this, you'll get four quadrants. I've drawn it for you. You'll get four quadrants. You'll have a y axis and an x axis. So some marker will be written like CD10, CD19, some marker will be written on one axis and other marker will be written on another axis, say CD19 and CD20 markers are written. Okay. Now tell me that in, do you agree that in this column, in this column, now just go by every column, you will make the X axis and the Y axis. Okay. So do you agree that this column or this square, this population is very high on the y axis and it is very very ahead on the x axis also this area is high on the y axis and ahead of the x axis so can i say it is going to be a double positive double positive yes okay in this region in this region x axis is also very low y axis is also very low can i say the both the markers are negative double negative do you agree do you agree with me double negative Okay, coming to this one, who will answer? Double positive, double negative or M1 positive, M2 positive. What is your take on this? What is your take on this? What is your take on this guys? Positive, negative, which one? This particular quadrant. What should I write over here? It's ahead on the X axis, but it is very low on the Y axis. So can I say this is M2 positive? M2 positive, M1 negative. Do you all agree? Very good. I've got the answer. M2 positive, M1 negative. And the last one over here, it's very high on the y-axis, means M1 positive, and it's very low on the x-axis, so it is M2 negative. So that is how you interpret. So you've got a double positive quadrant, a double negative quadrant, and single, single positive quadrants also. If you know this flow cytometry technique, you can now interpret this chart. So I've, I know many of you are saying that, ma'am, by now we've mugged up this chart because this has gone all over social media and all of you have taken screenshots from every app and posted it everywhere. So by now you've kind of mugged it up, but that's not how you should go for it. See, what do you see over here? What is written over here on the y-axis? SSC, that is side scatter, side scatter. And what is written over here? FITC. FITC is the name of the dye. Okay, so you'll have things like FITC, PE. These are all dyes. These are all colors. That is not your concern. You have to see what marker has been written. CD19 has been written. CD19. Is it a B cell marker or is it a T cell marker? It is going to be a it is a it's a pan B cell marker, CD19. So what have they done? By using a side scatter. By using a side scatter and a CD19, they have highlighted the B cells for you. They've labeled it. See, examiner has labeled the B cells also for you. And he's basically told you the red color. He's told you the red color of the B cells and highlighted it. How has he picked it up? He's picked it up by CD19. Okay. Come to the next flow chart, the next dot plot. Look at this. Look at this. What do you see out here? You see that... I told you to see the markers. On this axis, you have CD40. On this axis, you have CD19. Okay. So now you are interested in those red color cells, the B cells. So you pick up this area. Tell me, everyone tell me what is positive and what is negative. In this quadrant, out of CD19 and CD40, what should I keep positive? It's pretty ahead on the 19 axis. Can I say CD19 positive? Can I say CD19 positive? And can I say... CD40 negative. Can I say CD19 positive and CD40 negative? They are B cells. CD19 here, they are B cells, but they don't have a CD40. Very good, Dr. Siddharth. You've told us CD40, CD40 negative is something that you see in hyper IgM syndrome. So before I explain hyper IgM, you need to know this. See, B cells have something called CD40. And T cells have something called CD40 ligand. B cells have CD40 and T cells have CD40 ligand and CD40 and 40 ligand will obviously interact. When they interact, what happens is 
isotype switching when they interact what happens is isotype switching right so please remember isotype switching is see everyone do you know what are the receptors of the b cell basic immunity b cell receptor kya hota hai m and d b cell receptor is m and d you already have m and d but now you want to have the other antibodies also so you are switching class switching isotype switching ig m and d you already have now by this 40 40 l interaction you will have gae also that is isotype switching so tell me if a person has a problem in cd40 ligand or if a person has a problem in cd40 do you agree this isotype switching will not occur and if it will not occur patient will not have all the other antibodies he will end up with hyper igm syndrome hyper igm syndrome right is this okay with everyone so many of you asking me how will brutons look like how will lad look like first learn hyper igm we can always discuss those also to have first get hyper igm clear okay so uh, this is what it it is either there is a defect in cd40 ligand or there is a defect in cd40 so over here over here the dot plot that i showed you in that there was no cd40 cd40 was not there okay but if you wanted to test so when you wanted to test for cd40 you used cd40 if you want to test for cd40 ligand then what are you going to use remember cd154 if you want to test for the ligand then what are you going to use you are going to use cd154 so remember if you are detecting a cd ligand defect cd154 will be negative are we clear with this guys yes so definitely as you've asked me about brutons and all that's an all together separate uh, session that i've conducted on an academy on all the, it's a free class you can always go and view on all the immunodeficiency disorders so all of those you can get with all the details it's a full one hour lecture we can't put it in one question but yes hyper igm is something that they will ask you again and again so you should be very clear with that are we okay with this question should we move forward can you tell me what cells have i shown you over here another question on flow cytometry let's become flow cytometry experts now another question on the flow cytometry so they've got you something on the y axis and something on the x axis and they've asked you what is this brown box showing you what is this population of cells showing you so first think which quadrant it is it is a double positive double negative one positive what quadrant it is then you will know what cells am i talking about very good i've got four answers already so it's i hope you remember this is the double positive quadrant means i'm dealing with some cells which are cd25 positive and show fox p3 expression show fox p3 expression what cells are those those are the t regulatory cells what are t regulatory cells guys So when I say T cells, T cells, they are a type of CD4 only. They are a subset of CD4. They are a subset of CD4, but apart. So like T cells you study na CD4, CD8. These are CD4 cells only. But apart from CD4, they have expression of CD25 also. So that is what was being shown over here. They have expression of CD25 also. and they are regulated by the fox p3 gene and that is what was shown over here they are showing you expression of fox p3 also so you've got a population of cells which is showing you cd25 also fox p3 also that is t regulatory cells now who will tell me that if someone has a defect in fox p3 if fox p3 gene is defective what disease can the person suffer from if fox p3 gene is defective it's a quick uh, collateral question that i've put up quick collateral question yes fox p3 gene is detected on uh, or fox p3 gene is defective in ipex it is defective in ipex syndrome ipex syndrome should we do quickly the full form of ipex syndrome guys the full form of ipex syndrome i for everyone i want everyone to answer immune dysregulation i for immune dysregulation p for so immunity gone immune dysregulation p for polyendocrinopathy 
पॉलीएंडोक्रीनोपैथी ई फॉर एंटेरोपैथी ई फॉर एंटेरोपैथी एंड एक्स फॉर X linked disorder. It's an X linked disorder. It's very easy to learn. Fox, Ipex. All the X sounding things come together. So Fox P3 gene, Fox P3 gene is going to result in a uh, defect. Is going to result in Ipex syndrome. Ipex syndrome. Doctor Usha, uh, prior to this, you've asked me that where will CD 154 be expressed? No, see, CD 154 is a CD 40 ligand, na? So ligand is expressed on a T cell, so it will be expressed on the T cell, right? Okay, so very good. Everyone got me a correct answer on IPEX. Also, were you able to identify these charts very well? So now uh, I've given you a brief for those who've never learned about uh, flow cytometry. After this class, on the on the YouTube channel, type flow cytometry. See that entire video. It's something very very important for the INI CET exam. I'm also going to conduct a particular uh, quiz on flow cytometric graphs shortly in the coming month. before your exam so it's very important that you see your that video beforehand and then we can have that quiz okay let's move forward let's go on to the next one okay a little bit of histopath coming up your way there's a skin biopsy of a patient reveals the following features skin biopsy of a patient reveals the following features what is your tentative diagnosis so there was probably a skin nodule or maybe it was on the scalp or it was on the a uh, arm it's a skin nodule and a biopsy has been done and this is what you're seeing in front of you mastocytosis langerhans cell histiocytosis dermatitis metastatic crohn's disease what are the answers that i'm getting everyone calls it b okay uh why do you call it b give me a good valid reason because i agree with your answer i agree it is langerhans cell histiocytosis it is langerhans cell histiocytosis but you need to give me a valid reason for this what did you see in this photo that was very very prominent towards it one answer i've got coffee bean appearance but one answer i've not got there's one more thing that should have pointed towards it Okay, so I'll show you the image in an enlarged view. Let's look at this picture in zoom, uh, maximum magnification. Okay, can you see over here? Can you see over here that we have we have a cell, and that cell is showing you a groove. We have a cell, and that cell is showing you a groove, which all of us call call as coffee bean nucleus, which all of us call as coffee bean nucleus. Number one, but I'm not getting the second part, guys. Did you all miss out on these orange looking cells? Did you all miss out on these orangish looking cells having two two nuclei? What are they? Eosinophils. No one mentioned I I I hope I've not missed out. Okay Dr. Vikas did. Yes. Guys, eosinophils that's another very very important point that you have to note over here. Eosinophils because if you're thinking of coffee bean and you're thinking of lch see another nucleus over here where you can see a line going through it okay which type of lch will you now think of if you're thinking of lch and you're also seeing a lot and lot of eosinophils you will think of eosinophilic granuloma yes everyone agrees eosinophilic granuloma great so answer one more question Which of the following immunohistochemical marker will you use for confirmation? CD one A, CD two zero seven, HLA DR S hundred. You think that okay? This is LCH. Which of the following markers will you use for the confirmation? Quick answer on that, guys. It's an easy question. Okay. Also remember you are appearing for the INI CET exam which has clubbed AIMS and PGI and NIMHANS and everything JIPMER so maybe you could have different patterns also of the paper you could have different patterns of the paper guys think of the pattern also don't think of only one answer think of other answers also you know if you are thinking of LCH why did i get you this question because because all of these are immunohistochemical markers that we use for lch that is why i was saying do not think of it like a single best answer only think of it like a pgi paper also 
So what are the markers of LCH? CD1A, I think everyone knew. CD1A is the famous one. CD207 is something known as Langerin. The other name for this is Langerin. So you know by Langerin, you will anyway remember LCH. So Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So CD207. Even HLA, DR and S100 are positive. So you always have to learn these four. So never jump to just one answer. Everyone saw CD1A and didn't read the others. So please remember CD1A, CD207, HLA, DR and S100. Are we clear with this? All of the above was option over here. I could have given you all of the above as an option. But then you would have marked all in, you know, and not thought of it like this. Now you'll never forget all four were correct options. Last question. What is the gold standard microscopy that you'll use for the diagnosis of LCH? What is the gold standard uh, standard that you'll use for the diagnosis? Light, fluorescent, electron or phase contrast? I think this is an easy one. This is not uh, a Central Institute exam level question. It's pretty easy. We will use the, we will use the, electron microscopy we will use the electron microscopy so what do we see yes very good everyone's given me a correct answer what do we see on electron microscopy are these tennis racket appearance we see the very classical tennis racket appearance are we clear with this everyone tennis racket appearance so everything about LCH is done. You can have coffee bean nuclei, you can have eosinophils, you can have all those markers, CD1A, 207, HLA, DR, S100 and electron microscopy is the gold standard which shows you tennis racket appearance. The story is not over. Something that I taught you day before yesterday in the tables. LCH shows you which mutation. LCH shows you which mutation and this is what I've already taught you day before yesterday. So quick answer on that. And you could read it like this, you could read it like this, left to right, right to left. Both diseases show you same mutation. LCH, Langerhans cell histiocytosis and HCL, hairy cell leukemia, show you BRAF mutation. Do you all remember this? BRAF mutation, this is what we studied day before yesterday, yes? So all about LCH, over. Let's go to the next question. Okay, so this is just to show you that coffee bean nuclei, coffee bean nuclei are going to be seen in LCH. So you'll never forget it looking at the image. Okay, coming to the next question, a simple one-liner question, quick answer on that. You've done it in dermatology so many times. Ghost cells are seen in. Ghost cells are seen in. Cylindroma, pilomatrixoma, spiradenoma, syringoma. Basically, they're talking about all the skin appendageal tumors. All the skin appendageal tumors have been mentioned over here. You need to tell me where am I seeing the ghost cells. So remember, I'm getting a confusion between. Okay, many of you are answering D, syringoma. No, no. Ghost cells are something that you see in pilomatrixoma pilomatrixoma so let me show you let me show you the image let me show you an image so you know some people call it ghost cells some people call it shadow cells that you know you can see some outline type of a thing you can see some outline type of a thing and uh, these are anucleated they have nothing inside it so you know pilomatrixoma in the periphery if you see this part if you focus on this part you can see cells which have a blue color nucleus Whereas if you see the rest of the slide, you will see that you're just seeing pinkish material which is anucleated just like ghosts or shadows of a cell. These are ghost cells or shadow cells. They show you, uh, they are seen in pilomatrixoma which is a skin appendageal tumor. Many of you asking me, uh, Dr. Harshit, you're asking me craniopharyngioma. No, see craniopharyngioma we studied a few days back and that shows you wet keratin. It shows you wet keratin, okay, or which you know as the machine oil appearance. Here I'm teaching you ghost cells, but tell me where else can we see ghost cells? Dr. Vikas has already answered that as I was seeing in the comments. So ghost cells are seen number one in a skin appendageal tumor that is pilomatrixoma. And we've got one more condition or a kind of a necrosis where you see uh, ghost cells as well. Where you see ghost cells as well. Yes. 
necrosis i've given you quite a big hint you have to think of coagulative liquefactive caseous and so on coagulative necrosis so remember ghost cells are seen with pilomatrixoma and they are seen in coagulative necrosis as well okay with everyone yes okay yes dr parth you're right acid dilution test that is something that i'm going to uh, include in the uh, you know in the mock tests that i'll be conducting on telegram the next month so you've kind of leaked one of the questions right okay so moving on moving on coming to this one coming to this one there's an anterior neck swelling moving with deglutition shows the following finding i'm sorry that's not an fnac that's on a biopsy shows the following finding on a surgery or a biopsy patient gives history of long term use of antibiotics and what is the reason for this pigment that you see over here so you've got an anterior neck swelling you've got an anterior neck swelling they've done a surgery and that swelling is in front of you i hope you've understood what organ is this because moving with deglutition and the shape of the organ very well tells you that we are dealing with the thyroid it's got a brown black color and you have to tell me what is the reason on the basis of the history of the patient that he or she has shown you this black one yes so you've got minocycline usage melanoma age related or hemosiderin deposition so yes remember this condition is known as black thyroid you call it black thyroid so you know when you will put a needle in it like i said that you could also do an fnc or you could see the same on a surgery on a surgery you are seeing it with naked eye you are seeing the thyroid is completely black on fnc if you would have put a needle inside this thyroid you would have got a smear which would have shown you a lot of brown black pigment so you would have wondered you know as soon as we start seeing brown black pigment anywhere in the body the first thing we think of is melanin you know you'll start thinking is it a melanoma is it some um, you know melanin related tumor mel melanocyte related tumor but over here patient give you gave you a very long term usage of antibiotics let me tell you minocycline is a drug which has been associated long term use of minocycline has been associated with black thyroid why and how is still a very controversial uh, pathogenesis but definitely definitely this is causing black thyroid a pigment uh, many books have related this pigment to hemosiderin many have related it to lipofuscin so like i said this is quite a debatable topic but definitely you should know about the black thyroid minocycline or any long term antibiotic use that can cause moving on to the next question it's a gif question and i just want all of you to tell me what this particular um, machine or instrument is i've shown you earlier on the an academy platform but i could never show you the gif over there so i've got the gif because it works well on youtube so this is exactly how this machine works you see some plates inside it which are which are uh, going left and right which are Uh, you know uh, constantly i don't want to use the word otherwise i'll tell you the name of the machine also so tell me the name of this machine not given you options purposely i want all of you to think perfect it's a machine in the blood bank it's a machine in the blood bank yes this is a platelet agitator so you know all of you know this platelet at what temperature do you keep it and for how many days do you keep it and in what machine do you keep it this is the machine in which you keep platelets so constantly platelets the bags are going to be kept here the bags are going to be kept here and constantly the platelets have to move constantly they have to move guys okay so please remember please rem yes constant stirring very important so please remember the temperature at which the platelets are stored are going to be anyone 20 to 24 degrees 20 to 24 degrees 24 degrees and what is the uh, time for how many days can you store the platelets for 5 days the shelf life of platelets is 5 days so 20 to 24 degrees 5 days in this machine so the temperature of this machine is going to be 20 to 24 degrees yes i had posted this on my telegram because gifs work there as well so i hope everyone has been able to identify this so you know that uh, the aims had already introduced a lot of different pattern questions so this is a kind of question you can always expect next one so again this is a machine which i had also shown you i hope all of you are able to identify what exactly is happening over here 
what exactly it's a machine in the path lab and what are they showing you over here okay many of you answering 7 days no guys for platelet it was 5 days no doubt about that for platelet it's 5 days not 7 days what is this machine that you see out here so you've got someone with a rotary type of a uh, handle there's a female with a rotary type of a handle and there's something that is constantly cutting with a blade with a blade it is cutting so this is a microtome this is a microtome and if you if you have to actually uh, you know uh, call it by a more precise name it's a rotary microtome it's a rotary microtome that they are using over here what do you use it for when this is how you make your slides this is how you are going to make your slides guys remember this is how you'll make your slides so you've got a paraffin block and you're going to cut that paraffin block you'll get a section so do you see what is happening if you show you over here do you see constantly constantly the paraffin is being cut your tissue is being cut constantly and you're getting it on slides you're getting it on slides are we clear with this yes everyone i guess there's a little bit of a lag in the options or the answers that i'm getting from all of you uh but um, okay uh, dr furkan has asked me what is the purpose of platelet agitator if you don't keep the platelet under constant agitation you are going to uh, start uh, you'll start getting platelet aggregates so you don't want that you don't want the platelets to aggregate so you're constantly going to keep it under a uh, an agitation or a movement so that they stay away they don't aggregate that is the purpose i hope this machine is also clear with everyone this is a this is a microtome uh, to be very precise it it is a rotary microtome let's move forward okay can you tell me what technique is this and what stain has been used what technique is this and what stain has been used okay so the name of the technique i hope everyone's seen that i can see a lot of chromosomes over here and i've used a stain which is giving it a okay so before that uh, many of you have said that uh, this is uh, only used for frozen sections the previous machine you're calling this only for frozen sections well no not at all you can even use it for regular sections frozen section machine will be okay next time you got a question for next time a frozen section machine that is known as a cryostat okay that's known as a cryostat and it's a closed machine because you have to keep the temperature in minus for the frozen environment over here you've kept it in the open air and room temperature you've kept it in the open air and room temperature is there a problem with the video guys Okay is there is there any problem with the video or is it sorted now Can I get a confirmation on the same is is the audio video lagging in any way now as well Is it is it okay now everyone Okay I guess let's let's take up another question if uh, if it's okay let's see if uh, it works fine 
So now let's begin from this slide again. I hope everyone got the previous two right. I hope everyone got the previous two right. That is, this was a platelet agitator where you are using it to agitate the platelets or keep it constantly under agitation. Secondly, this was a rotary microtome. Many of you were calling this the cryostat. No, I'll show you a picture of a cryostat in the next class. In cryostat, you have to keep the temperature in minus to keep everything in frozen state. So you can't keep it like an open machine in room temperature, right? So this is just a rotary microtome okay next what is this technique and what is the stain so i hope now it's all working well so the technique is um many of you are calling it fish uh but you know this is you're right it could be fish as well but the stain that you've used over here this is also a stain that we use for a type of karyotype if i say that this technique is a karyotype if I say that this technique is a karyotype, then which stain are you going to call it? Then which stain are you going to call it? This will be known as a quinacrine stain. This is a quinacrine stain. So every time the karyotype doesn't look black and white. Every time the karyotype is not going to look black and white. Karyotype can look fluorescent also. Why? The chromosomes can look fluorescent because you've used a quinacrine stain. That's a fluorescent stain for which you'll be needing a fluorescent microscopy. Yes? Uh, yes, uh, you're right guys. I think there's a little bit of a lag because of which I'm receiving your messages a little late. I do have my eye on them, but I'm receiving your messages a little late because of the lag. But I guess we can continue, uh, right? Okay, so um, Q banding exactly. This is known as this is known as Q banding. Uh, 